Welcome to Deep Water Wednesday, presentation of Messiah Community Church. Yeah, we don't have the live audience here today, and uh, so I don't have anybody cheering in the background. Uh, they were fake anyway. What can I say? Hey, listen, we have a great lesson here for uh, this Wednesday, and I, I think it's going to apply to a lot of us because there is so much going on in the world today. And, and many believers have their backs against the wall. I mean, whether it's sickness or it's money issues, um, it's things that we believe that we've held dear to our hearts for years and years, and all of a sudden, you know, that thing's gone away or it stopped or whatever. There are a lot of things going on right now, and it seems like a lot of believers have their backs against the wall. And we don't know what to do. And, and people are fretting and they're wringing their hands and they're saying, oh, what do we do? What do we do? And, and consequently, we pray wrong. We think wrong. We act wrong. And the story of the Exodus gives us a lot of information and gives us a lot of understanding on how we ought to behave and how we ought to act. And, and uh, so we're, we're kind of taking it slow through some of this uh, first part of Exodus, and it's been pretty doggone good. We've come across some really good stuff. So I am believing that the Lord God of heaven is going to open your minds as you listen to this lesson. The Lord is going to implant in your heart some nugget, some thing out of what is taught tonight so that you can rejoice in him, you can be strong in your faith, your ability to carry on your life is going to increase and we just pray that over you we pray that jesus gives you an appearance in your heart of who he is so that you have a knowledge of the length and breadth and depth of his love for you because that's important that's really what's important that you get and and so let's get into the lesson here because we've got some really good stuff i i can't wait we're in excavating the exodus part 13 and I don't know how many parts we're going to have. It's going to be a lot, probably more than their chapters, I would think. But there's a lot of information, and so we're going to keep going through it. First one, Exodus chapter 14, verse 27 through 31. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal course when the morning appeared. And as the Egyptians fled into it, the Lord threw the Egyptians into the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen. Of all the host of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. Now, this is a total annihilation. Understand that a total annihilation of the Egyptian army. And all of those horsemen, because they didn't, if you remember from prior lessons, they did not have the foot soldiers with them. They only had the horsemen and the chariots with them. Uh, for all the speculation regarding this event, one thing we know for sure is that the army of Egypt was annihilated. It was totally destroyed. By water, by reeds, it doesn't make any difference. God drowned them in whatever was there. If you want to believe it was reeds, God drowned them in reeds. If you want to believe it was water, God drowned them in water. In any regard, God drowned an entire army, the biggest, baddest army of the day, and God did it under. Now, we're going to learn some lessons here because um, as they came up, the children of Israel were able to cross over on dry ground. And after they crossed over, the Egyptians felt like they could go over as well. So they began that, that chase. They were right behind them. Once they got into that area, the Lord collapsed the, the water on top of them and drowned them all. And it says here, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the sea returned to its normal course. That should tell you it was an actual sea, not reeds. And it happened as the morning appeared. So this went on at night. And it, so it happens. And the Egyptians, they fled into the waters. And the Lord threw the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. It says that he, he dumped them in there. Uh, so it was really the Lord that destroyed all these people. Now, the people of Israel walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters being a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Their bodies were floating up. 
Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. So because of what Moses had been telling them, they, they weren't buying into it. And they, if you remember when they were on the other side of, uh, of the sea, they, um, they were like a lot of us. They're wondering, you know, they see their enemy coming up on them. They're wondering, hey, Moses, you know, hey, pastor, uh, what are you leading us into here? I mean, we, we don't have any hope. I mean, how is this thing going to happen? I, I don't understand. What's, what's the deal? And, and yet, here we have it, that God is talking to the children of Israel. God is dealing with them. And he's, he's uh, performing this incredible miracle of drowning an entire army in front of them after they just walked over the sea on dry ground. And so, all of a sudden, hey, we believe. <laughs> it's how it happens. It's, but it's easy to believe. When the Lord does something incredible before your eyes, it's very easy. It doesn't take long for Israel to back away from the fear of the Lord. We're going to see that as we go into other following lessons. We're, we're going to see it just cycles over and over. And just like us believers, just, just like Christians in churches today. Um, it, it, it just seems that people, as much as we know, as much as we have available to us to really know who God is, to really know his presence. It just seems like so many people are just troubled all the time as if God doesn't know what's going on here. And we're going we're gonna to give you some help with that tonight. Look at Psalm 106, verses 11 through 14. The waters covered their adversaries. This is talking about that event, the, the drowning of the Egyptian army. Not one of them was left. Then they believed his words. They sang his praise. But they soon forgot his works. They did not wait for his counsel, but they had a wanton craving in the wilderness and put God to the test in the desert. Now, they believed God because of what they saw, but when it came back to their situation, when things returned back to normal, as soon as things went south a little bit, psh, they forgot to keep praising I mean, they they were good. They were praising God. It's it's like you know people that show up. They show up for six months after the Lord does something really well. They'll show up to church. They praise men. They dance. They shout, and, and everything else. Uh, and they give their offerings, and they're happy about it. And then all of a sudden, you know, things kind of start waning, and and they back away. Next bad event comes up, and the same thing cycles in. This is here is a great lesson for all of us, because. One of the most important things in our lives is our praise life, our life of thanksgiving. The time to praise him is always. The time to praise him is always. Praise and the giving of thanks to Yahweh, yud heh bab -Hey, are essential to our spiritual health. They just are. They're essential to it. And and. I feel sorry for people that go to church and there's no worship music. There's no praise music. You know, there, there's not an opportunity to dance or an opportunity to shout or an opportunity to give testimony about what God's doing. I mean, I feel sorry for people like that. Um, I, I like a lively service. I like a lively time when people get up and they give testimonies of everything God is doing. I can't wait for the day when to hear a good, really good testimony of somebody saying, Man, you, wait till you hear what the Lord did. And I'm like, tell me. Tell me right now. This will be good, you know. I, I, I like to record things like that. I, I, I like to get some history and, well, how did this happen? How did that happen? You say, well, why are you that interested in all that stuff? I mean, it's just somebody's story. Because it's praise. Because it builds up your faith. Because it's something that gives you encouragement. And especially, listen, especially if you're going through something. You're going through a you know a surgery of some sort. You're going through a financial crisis of some sort. You want to hear the testimonies of people who have been through what you've been through. It's it's like if I was uh, back in the day when this happened, and, and I had decided I was going to join up later on with Israel, and uh, looking around and they got enemies you know starting to surround them and stuff, I would want to know that God was able to take care of them. I would want to know that God had already uh, done something so spectacular that all these people were out there believing. and Because I, I want to believe. 
I want to know that there is a God who is way bigger than all the gods of this earth and all the gods that we faced before. I want to know that in my heart. And so here we go with this um, understanding, and I want to give you some good verses here. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Now, you notice here that they use the divine name. Um, before God even had, had given it to them, they're, they're using the divine name to... Um, to identify who it is. Now, Exodus was written, though, afterwards. And so, whatever they called the Lord, they they called him by a name that was different than the gods of this earth, the gift different than the gods of Egypt. They, they weren't exalting some just some uh, space-age god or, or some cloud or uh, the moon or the stars or the sun. They weren't exalting that. They were exalting who they knew brought them out of that land. The crossing at the Red Sea and the destruction of the army of Egypt is cause for thanksgiving and praise. But this raises a real moral dilemma. And, and I just want to, this is kind of like a little bunny trail I want to throw in. Is it right to celebrate the death of human beings? You say, well, nobody in their right mind would celebrate the death of a human being. Okay. I, I grant you that. Nobody would. Not anybody in their right mind, anyway. And yet, there are people celebrating today the death of innocent human beings. It's called abortion. Those who are pro that kind of thing in life, they celebrate. They, they have parties. They have victory uh, things when they win something. And uh, they have for years. There is a whole group of people that will celebrate the death of human beings. And you say, well, well, well that's, that's just sick. It's demented. Well, a lot of people obviously don't think that. And yet, right here in the midst of this, we have this moral dilemma. Is it really right, regardless of who it is, to celebrate the death of a human being? Now, there's a well-known passage in the Talmud regarding this same event. It states that the angels also broke out in singing with the nation of Israel. But the Talmud states that the Lord rebuked the angels. God says to them, My creatures, talking about the Egyptians, are drowning, and you sing songs? God does not rebuke Israel, who were the potential victims here in this story, he allows them to rejoice at their enemy's defeat. Now, this story answers this big question for the believer. Is it wrong to celebrate the destruction of people? No, of course not. I don't, I don't care who it is. It's not wrong to celebrate their destruction. Or it is wrong to celebrate their destruction. But it is wrong to celebrate this. But is it wrong? Is it wrong? to celebrate the destruction of evil. Now, on one hand, we have people, right? Human beings. People you know. Enemies. People that aren't good. People in, people in places in government. What about the Nazis that came against uh, the whole world, really? And the Japanese, way back when? Should we have celebrated winning those wars? Or celebrated when... The Allied troops had a big victory. What about when we went against different other nations at different times? The Korean War and so on and so forth. I mean, really some bad people. And they were coming after uh, other human beings to enslave them or to kill them like they Hitler did the Jews. Was it right to rejoice over their death? There were a lot of people who rejoiced over Saddam Hussein's death. There were a lot of people who rejoiced when Osama bin Laden uh, was killed. People rejoiced over that. Well, it, is it right ever to rejoice over a human being's death? I would say 
it's not right to rejoice over any human being because that's a tragic loss of life. It's a tragedy. I mean, we can be, uh, we can be okay that our enemies were defeated if our enemies are evil. Evil uses human beings. They're willing accomplices in evil. No human being who does evil um, got there with, without any choice. They were given a choice at some point in time in their life. They were given a choice to believe. They were given a choice to act. They were given a choice, whether it was when they were real young and they were brainwashed or they, they encountered different things. People had a choice. And, and as they grew up and they saw other people and other ways of living, maybe, maybe their house was evil or maybe they were under evil influence their whole life. Uh, they still had an opportunity to see, because God gives every man an opportunity, to see good. And they just choose not to do it. They choose not to do evil. Should we, we rejoice at a human being's death? The answer is absolutely not, especially innocent human beings. We should never rejoice over innocent people being killed. But what about people who are evil or being used by evil? Should we celebrate or should we be okay that there are people who are incredibly evil, and they end up dying as a result of a war or uh, a country defending themselves or maybe somebody defending themselves. I would say we should not celebrate the death of the people. We should celebrate the death of the evil. Well, that's like splitting hairs. <laughs> maybe it is, but the whole scripture is set up to, to let us know uh, what we ought to be able to do, how we ought to think, because people are really conflicted with this kind of type of thing. And, and so let's take a look here. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And you who were dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of your trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him. Now this is obviously talking about what Jesus did. This verse should put in our hearts and, and put our hearts to rest and put in our hearts the right thing to do in, in the moral dilemma that's posed here in the book of Exodus. What should our response be to the destruction of evil? Our heart should be that we, we recognize that evil was put to an open shame. Disarmed. Disarmed. Put to an open shame. And Jesus triumphed over them. God triumphs over evil in Christ. The defeat of the devil. Something we ought to rejoice at. We ought, we ought to shout about. We ought to, you know... Uh, Resurrection Sunday should be the biggest celebration in the church because of what happened. Our lives being raised up, the day that we got born again, ought to be a day of, of celebration. Why? Because our enemy was defeated. We ought to celebrate that. We ought to celebrate as often as possible, in fact. We ought to give praise and thanksgiving to God as often as possible over the defeat of our enemy. Now, I want to give you a couple verses here because this kind of gets interesting about this role of rejoicing. Because when Israel got to the other side, Moses breaks out in a song. Miriam picks up a tambourine. She had brought some tambourines. Tambourines, by the way, were, were um, instruments used to celebrate a victory or to celebrate life. They, they would use them at weddings. They would use them in special times. It was a very special instrument to the children of Israel at the time because it represented life, and it represented enemies being defeated. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, it says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, the idea of giving thanks to God for every situation we find ourselves in is not a New Testament idea. It's really an Old Testament idea. Paul here tells the uh, Thessalonian church to rejoice, rejoice always, 
to pray without ceasing and give thanks in all circumstances. All circumstances. Well, what about if you find out you have something? Rejoice. Give thanks. Thank the Lord that you, you get to go through whatever it is you're getting to go through. Well, that's kind of sick, you know? I mean, what, what if it's a bad surgery? What if it's a bankruptcy? What if it's a, a loss of somebody? Listen, I, I didn't write these verses. I'm just telling you what I know works. In all circumstances, give thanks to God. Because you don't know what God is doing for you in that particular circumstance. In fact, he even says, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So this is the will of God for you is to pray without ceasing, to rejoice always, and to give thanks in every circumstance. That's God's will for you. God wants you to see that when your back is against the sea, your enemy is coming at you. You've got things surrounding you in every circumstance. It doesn't look good. The, the report's bad. You know, the, the banker's bad. The, uh, your creditors are bad. Uh, your, your boss is bad. The job's bad. The economy's bad. The government's bad. Whatever it is, rejoice and give thanks that you have the opportunity to go through whatever it is that you're going to go through because God is there and God is going to make out whatever it is. It's going to turn out to your good and to God's glory. Oh, what, what about things that don't turn out? That, wait for it. Wait for it. I don't write the rules. God does. And there are a lot of things in this life that I, believe me, I scratch my head about and I go, yeah, you know, that's something I'm going to ask God when I get there. But a lot of things years later, I find out why that circumstance was there. I find out why that thing had to happen, that the way it had to happen. What were the circumstances? What what things did um, transpired as a result of it? Whose lives were changed? What kind of things happened that were changed forever because of some something, some event that happened where God intervened? This is the formula to keep believers in the place of faith. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. You say, well, you know, that's kind of crazy. Well, let's go on. We'll give you some more verses. 1 Corinthians 14, 12 through 19. <coughs> so with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. But my mind's unfruitful. I want to get to why it, Paul talks about in this particular verse in, in 1 Corinthians, why he talks about praying in tongues. Praying in tongues or speaking in tongues is for the building up, or it's not, um, it's not about speaking in tongues. It, it's never been about speaking in tongues. It's never been about, you know, jibber-jabber in the church or people being able to do that and then claiming some, you know, higher position or anything. It's never been about that. It has always been about building people up. In fact, Paul says, one who prays in an unknown tongue edifies himself, builds himself up. The whole reason why he tells us if we pray in a public square and we are praying in, in the Spirit, he tells us to pray that we interpret for this purpose, building people up. He says very specifically, by the way, um, tongues is just a tool to accomplish this. Pray, ask, right? Sing, which is praise, and give thanks. This same formula is repeated throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Ask, praise, give thanks. The things that build people up, the things that change things. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit. But I will pray with my mind also. I will sing with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, listen to this, otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit. So what's very important here? Giving thanks. If you give thanks with your spirit, 
How can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't understand that you're giving thanksgiving? For you may be giving thanksgiving well enough, but the other person's not being built up. How can people say, and so be it? That's what amen means, and so be it. If they don't understand what they're saying, and so be it, for. Our thanksgiving to God builds us and others up. Everybody, every single person in this era, this time frame of the Exodus, they all understood thanking their God. Everybody understood that. Whatever, whoever God that was, the sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, a rock, whatever it was, everybody understood you have to thank your God for your God to continue to perform. They all had that understanding. Paul here is giving us a whole different understanding of thanksgiving, though. Us having thanksgiving, us expressing our thanks, to God Almighty for who He is and for what He's done in our life and for the things He's done in our life. That understanding of thanksgiving, that thanksgiving that we're giving up, builds other people up because they go, oh, wow, they're not just giving thanksgiving to have a God perform. They're giving thanksgiving because their God actually did do something. Because they're, they believe so much in who their God is that he's changing their life or he's he's doing things in their life. Nation of Israel needed to give thanksgiving. Now would have been a good time. They'd just been delivered from their enemy, the oppressor for 400 years. It'd be a really good time to do that. You know, every day, think about how long you were lost without Christ. Every day should be a day of thanksgiving. Every day should be a time when you rejoice, when you lift up your hands to the Lord and go, wow, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, Paul says. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. The instruction to others is all the reasons they should worship the one true and holy God. That's what Paul's telling us. Paul is speaking of the importance of expressing our gratitude to him for who he is and for what he's done. It is this gratitude that brings hearts to him. The, the gratitude of the believer, the goodness of God draws men to repentance. The goodness of God, not the judgment of God, not the rebuke of God, it is the goodness of God that people see and they hear our testimonies, they hear the gratefulness of our heart, they understand how, uh, you know, we're just like, oh, wow, you see what God has done? You know what God has done? Look at how gracious he is. That understanding people get. And they are drawn to repentance that way. When a people forget to have a grateful heart, they forget the God of graciousness. They lose their humility and they take to themselves other gods. It's what Israel did. It's what every nation has done. Every single people group that ever had an encounter with God, quickly forgot that God was there. David, Solomon, all of them. David's a little different, though, because David continues to come back. He recognizes as soon as a prophet says something or as soon as he recognizes where he's at, he comes back to God. Oh, God, I messed up. Help me, oh, God. And, and that's where our heart is. That's, that's how you know your heart is really connected to God when you are grateful Grateful is not just, oh, yeah, thanks, God. Uh, you know, your son died. Hey, thanks a lot, buddy. That, that's not gratefulness. Gratefulness is when every day in your life, you live your life knowing what he did, understanding what he did. You, you're, you're thankful. You're, you're, your heart is grateful for who he is. And that he would, in, in all of his awesomeness, he would think about us. He would be consumed with us. Take a look here at Romans 1, 21 through 23. I know I, I hit these verses fairly often. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were dark and claiming to be wise. They became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. The whole basis of Romans 1 is ingratitude. 
ingratitude toward yud heh vav -Hey, toward God Almighty. People, people just, eh. We know enough. Science, money, wealth. I mean, that's what people do. And then in the course of that, they turn around and they forget. They forget the God of their salvation. They forget the God that's good. His principal attributes, God's principal attributes, are mercy and grace. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's a grateful heart. I understand who God is. He's attached to me because of his son Jesus, because of his Holy Spirit that dwells in me. Goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Wow. 2 Corinthians 4.15 For it is all for your sake, so that his grace extends to more and more people. It may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. Paul explains to the Corinthians that he had been under intense persecution and had his whole life threatened many, many, multiple times and, and was actually left for dead and all kinds of other things. And he goes through the whole history of all that for him to, to let them understand what things he's been facing. Now, he makes it clear that everything that has happened to him was so that the word of grace could go forward. And, and as grace was revealed to more and more people, is what he's saying here, to more and more people, they become thankful. When people are released from captivity, they have thankful hearts. Is there something in this constant state of thankfulness toward God for your life that makes life better? Well, yeah. If I'm in a constant state of gratitude toward God, I start seeing more things that he's done. I start understanding how close he is. I start knowing that he's the you know cloud covering me by day so I don't burn up. He's the fire that's there by night to warm me up. I start understanding who he is. I start understanding, really, I will be with you always, even into the ends of the earth. I start understanding that so that when I'm in the middle of the fire, I have no fear. When I'm in the process of, of uh, tragedy, I still see the God of my life. I still see the God of salvation. I still see the fourth man in the fire. Right? That's, that's the message. That's the lesson here. 2 Corinthians 9, 10 through 12. He who supplied seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing, increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also, listen to this, is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. The Corinthian offerings uh, to help Paul's ministry increase thanksgiving to God from those who are blessed by it. You kind of get the picture? God is looking for people to be thankful, to recognize him, to be gracious to him, because that opens the door. That thanksgiving opens the door. What Israel did when they got to the other side, that opened the door of God's supply for them. It opened the door for them to be able to see who he is. It opened the door for more miracles because they were thankful. Take a look here at Philippians 4, 4-7. through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord's at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You want to know the peace, the, the real secret of peace. How can you have peace in every circumstance? How can you get through these things? How can you have all these stresses and still have peace? Well, right here. In everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. The Philippians were told to rejoice always. Didn't make any difference. The sun was out or it hadn't been out. Doesn't make any difference if, 
if they're rich or poor. doesn't make any difference what their circumstance is, if they're losing everything or they're gaining everything. Rejoice always. They are given the key to contentment and peacefulness. Every prayer you offer as a request from God should be done with thanksgiving. All the prayers we offer up, God, I need this, God, I need that, uh, God, I need your help here, or God, I need your help there. All of those things should be done with thanksgiving. Because in that thankfulness, in that thankfulness, we start to see God move. We start to understand his presence. We start to see all this is, looks like it's moving slow, but it's not. It's God putting things in order. Oh, this doesn't look like I should have had this circumstance, but it's God putting things in order. It doesn't look like this sickness or this disease or this pain or this hurt. It doesn't look like this should have been good for me. It doesn't look like this should have been right. It doesn't look like it was God at all. But then you stop and you're thankful. And you say, Lord, I thank you that I've got this going on in my life. I thank you. Use me however you do so that people can understand thankfulness. So that people can have gracious hearts towards you. So that people can be grateful and have gratitude towards you. In the midst of my circumstance, they can see that you're God. That's what God's looking for. That's the lesson that we find here in, in the book of Exodus, right off the bat. Colossians 2, 6-7 says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thankfulness. As we walk in our, our lives in Christ, we are to abound in thanksgiving. Abound in thanksgiving. That means overflowing in thanksgiving. Well, I don't have anything to be thankful for. Did you wake up this morning? Did you breathe air? Did you eat? Were you able to eat? Did you have any water to drink? Was there anything? Did anybody say anything to you? Did anybody say hi to you? Was there anything at all that happened where you could see God? You could see his presence. You could know that he was with you. Then be thankful. Because in the middle of that Thanksgiving, the good, the bad, the indifferent situation, it shouldn't dictate. It should never dictate your state of Thanksgiving. Never. Or your state of mind. When it comes to thanking God for our deliverance, we ought always to be thankful. We ought always to be grateful. We ought always to have a, a joyful heart about it. This is the lesson of Israel being backed up against the wall. It really is. It's Israel being backed up against the wall. What do they do? Thank God. Uh, they just watched the Egyptians drown in the sea. Thank God. The next day, we're going to find out they don't have water. You know what they ought to be doing? Thanking God. It's an opportunity for God to show himself strong. They're supposed to learn to be thankful for God's hand on their nation. In Colossians 4, verse number 2, it says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Thankful prayer. You see, we all, every day, we have an opportunity to be thankful. We have an, uh, we have an opportunity to be gracious toward God. We have an opportunity to show God our grateful heart. To say to him, Lord, I'm, I'm glad for my wife. I'm glad for my children. I'm glad for my mom and dad. I'm glad for the situation I'm in. I'm glad for my house, my cars, my all of it. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for making whatever I drive, whatever I do, whatever job I have, whatever family I have. Thank you for making them in my life, for bringing them here and giving them to me. Thank you. Try this out sometime. Bad situation happens. Try stopping for a moment and just saying, God, I thank you that I'm going through this situation. Thank you because I know you're going to get me on the other side. I just rejoice in you. I, I am so gracious to you that you're giving me an opportunity here to, to see my enemy defeated, to watch as my enemies crumble beneath me because Jesus is my Lord, because he's my God. He is my strength, my shield, my high tower, my buckler. He is everything and he is the all in all. Try doing that 
Try thanking God in the middle of a bad time and see if it doesn't help your spirit build you up and change the atmosphere. God's good. That's the, that's the lesson of the Exodus. God is good. Glad you joined us tonight. We're having a great week, and you're having a great week. And I believe this hump day, you're going to get into a place of extreme gratefulness. Have some Thanksgiving today. Rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. Blessings to all. Thank you for joining Messiah Community Church for a good lesson tonight. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Let's listen to Elijah a minute. today. If you would like to support the ministry, go to messiahcommunity.org and click the donate button.